welcome. Uh, thank you for coming and your interest in this topic. Uh, it's a topic that's gotten me quite interested in the last couple of years um, because it, we really don't have good solutions out there. So it's a nice, hard, meaty problem, and those are the fun ones. Uh, my name is Kate Stewart. I work at the Linux Foundation. I'm one of the directors of uh, strategic programs there. And so I have a group of projects that I work on uh, and work with um, to see if we can you know, make things a little bit better. I just want to start this off with a quick survey of how many of you write code that uh, makes it into a product? How many, how many of you guys? I want to see what the audience is. OK, most of you. Good. Yeah. Oh, keep your hands up now. Do you know if you're, uh, keep your hands up if you know the code you wrote is bug free. <laughs> okay. No hands are up. So you, I'm not even sure if I should ask the next question, which is, you know, keep your hands up if you'd bet your life on it. Because that's kind of what safety critical software is going to be about, <laughs> is we need to make sure that our code is such that we can trust it um, in applications where it is truly safety critical. Oops. Let's see if this will, hello. Uh, there, next. There we go. How many people recognize her? Cool. Well, for those who don't, um, this is Margaret Hamilton, and she was uh, working on uh, letting the team, I think, that did the Apollo 11 software. Uh, and it's effectively, she's the first person who did software, well, software that runs, first software to run off the planet. And it was as a result of some of the testing that was happening there that we didn't have. Um, <laughs> catastrophic problems uh, for the launch. She was actually at uh, ICSI in Gothenburg last year doing the keynote, and I got the pleasure of listening to her and meeting her afterwards. And, you know, the story that she has to tell was really quite fascinating, and this is from her slides from that presentation. And basically, the software had to be ultra reliable and had to detect and, and recover. And this is still at the heart of the problem for us right now in safety critical applications. Everyone was, you know, dedicated, wanting to do the best job they can. And one of my first memories was my dad bringing me downstairs to watch the men land on the moon on a black and white TV in the basement. But that was one of my first memories. And it would have been quite a different story if they had not taken the care and debugging that had happened to make sure that this software was safety critical because there was an error. And there's one switch she said that uh, she had a kid in her with her at the office debugging some stuff, and the kid knocked a switch, and there was this really weird error. They didn't know what happened, and they realized that it shouldn't be happening when it was in a certain mode. So they had the switch very carefully marked, do not toggle the switch in flight, and sure enough, someone bumped up against it. But because they'd seen that in the testing in advance, they knew how to recover from it. And so all that level of detail and really understanding what possibly could go wrong and making sure we can fix it is key. Earlier this year, I also was uh, fortunate enough to attend another keynote um, by Dana Lewis. And she's uh, one of the co-founders of the OpenAPS project, which is the um, artificial pancreas system. And the hashtag is we are not waiting. Um, what they've done is they've taken an insulin pump, and they've taken a glucose monitor, and they've put a Linux Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi running Linux between the two, to create a feedback loop to better monitor um, glucose levels, and they've been collecting data, they're sharing the data, they're doing everything out in the open, all the sources available for this. It's a safety application, but Linux is being used here. And it's good enough right now for this you know, purpose. Um, it's part of that loop, though. And we're seeing people are finding software available right now that they want to use, and they can make their life better. Um, you know, I highly, I've got the links here in the talk. I'll be posting them. I uh, highly encourage you to watch her video. If you've got a, you know, a family member with diabetes, and she just came out with a book on, on Amazon as well. I put the book's link there too. But by setting up a loop and setting up that feedback loop as a hobbyist, they've managed to make this information available, and she's managing to manage her blood glucose levels because she's diabetic herself. So she has a very vested interest in making sure this thing is safe and it actually has improved the quality of her life by doing this. You know, every day in some sense is a risk. But um, she gave a really good keynote, 
and helped inspire me on this whole subject too. <laughs> so I started thinking about the safety side more and more. Um, and more, it's pretty clear we also have a bit of a culture gap that kicks in right now. So open source software developers are very much in the fail fast, fail early, fail often, iterate, iterate, make it better. That's where all the innovation's coming from, no question. When we're actually going for functional safety, we have a very methodot, methodot, very rigid process of defining a system, looking at things in the context of the system, and so forth. So there's this culture clash that has emer that sort of emerged in the minds of the software developers. And you don't have each knowledge each domain doesn't know too much about the other to some extent. You have people that are very very specialized in the functional safety space, and you have open source. And so part of the challenge we've got right now is how do we start bridging that gap and making people communicate effectively? So why it's the people we need to get in the room together. We need to get the certification authority people who really understand safety talking to the open source people. The Agile Manifesto, if you look at it one side and you look at the other side, the other side is pretty much what the functional safety people believe in. The Agile side is pretty much what most of the open source developers I know believe in. And so how do we get it so that both sides can work well together is the challenge that we're facing right now in the ecosystem if we want to be using open source in functional safety spaces. Because the users are going to demand accountability if their lives are potentially on the line here. You know, who's, a, you know, who's going to be important? The reason that Dana's team is doing this is that no medical device manufacturer is going to spend the money at this point in time because of the liability issues of going through the full FDA certifications. And they want to use it today. Hash, we are not waiting. So people are wanting to use this stuff. And the question is, no one wants to be first. How do we get to there? So you know, is it compatible with the safety standards? Well, the short answer is yes. However, there is a large level of things that potentially have to get done that people are not used to doing in the open source space. Um, there's also a large number of safety standards that have different requirements. And open source is showing up in all of these spaces right now. And there's more standards likely on the way. This is at the heart of this V model. And requirements traceability and understanding software in the context of a system is at the heart of the safety. And doing, um, making sure your system is safe. Because you have to understand what's being used in what context. And you have to basically decompose the system and look and make sure all the components interact properly to make sure that the overall story is safe, which is a lot of analysis. And you start with the user story, what you're trying to accomplish, and you work your way down. Well, a lot of the open source projects are components in there. They're not the full story. They're being worked on in context of things. And we don't really have a lot of experience of looking at these components in, their, um, you know, in multiple contexts with all the analysis around them. So we're sort of working our way through this. The key for open source is we have to understand how it's going to get used. We have to define its scope. And as much information as we can track to prevent regressions is going to be part one of the key aspects for us. Um, as much as we, yeah, go for it. OK, is that, just do, do, do the up signal for me if I go silent again. I, I'm not the uh, most dynamic of a public speaker, I'm afraid. Other people are much better than me. But um, this is something I feel very careful, you know, passionate about. So I really like to make sure we, people understand and can see if they can figure out how to help here, too. But there's a lot of things we can do with the tools available to us today. And there's a lot more tools we're going to need here to make this seamless um, and to work with open source. Most of the tools that are out there right now are proprietary. And if you've got an open source project, and you're trying to figure out how to get these regression things going and to keep problems from coming back in, um, there's room for a lot of innovation. <laughs> so the key for us is going to be building on top of open source strengths, which is public code review. It's available. And there's feedback to improve quality happening all the time in open source. People are filing bugs. People are fixing bugs. Um, but 
these elements here are elements that show up in the security standards of who's reviewing, are they, tra are they trusted, are they trained, um, do they know what is going on? And that's the piece that's part of missing for us right now that I've seen. Anyone is free to disagree with me here and educate me, okay, in this room. But this is what I've been finding from talking to a lot of people over the last year. So at the Linux Foundation, um, we've got a couple of projects that are all trying to start to focus on safety. And they're all taking slightly different approaches here. And we're trying to basically figure out, okay, how do we get the best in breed stories going? And if there's, we, like I say, we couldn't find good examples out there. And so it's a question of these, each of these projects is trying to tackle this in their own space right now. So I was just gonna go through a little bit of how these guys are approaching it so you can sort of see the different types of problems they're looking at. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is Zephyr, which is much closer to a traditional RTOS. There's a lot of open source RTOSs out there right now. And for small RTOS, these are sort of the criteria you kind of like, is you wanna have something that can have something that can go to a safety-oriented architecture. This is things that'll go into sensors, very, very small devices, 8K up, that type of stuff. Definitely under two meg, Linux won't fit. You wanna make sure you have it security, you wanna have your POSIX, you wanna have these types of characteristics with it. Well, of those operating systems, the ones that have visible explicit paths, FreeRTOS and Amazon FreeRTOS will work through a proprietary one called Safer RTOS. Zephyr has made a public statement of working with our LTS to auditable and we're basically working on segmenting and refining down what we're doing. Who's aware of what Zephyr is in the room? Then I'm gonna go fast. <laughs> Anyone who didn't have put their hand up and wants to talk to me more about it, I'll be talking about Zephyr later this afternoon. But this is our Zephyr project, and um, we started it off with the view that we wanted to go after safety and security targets with this goal. And this slide has been around since the start of the project. In fact, before the start of the project, and what we were trying to do is figure out how to we keep the pace of innovation that the community would do, but then be able to transform the code into something that's auditable. And we've done this by taking the same type of long-term support mechanisms that the Linux kernel is using, where you're freezing a code base, and then from that we're taking a subset and we're working on hardening it and getting it ready for um, going through certification audits. That is Zephyr, that's what we're doing with Zephyr. Um, and then in that subset we're focusing on even smaller parts and then building our way up over time uh, in terms of what the work we're doing. Um, quality is obviously one of the most important pieces here. It's a foundation for that. So making sure we have a very sound code base is one of the key things that's being focused on. Um, the guidelines, the, cert the certification authorities right now are very familiar with certain guidelines like MISRA and other standards. And so we are actually looking at implying um, what makes sense for MISRA and then documenting what doesn't for the Zephyr code base and explaining why so we can work with the authorities on this. But we do have challenges. Um, MISRA is controversial to use in certain spaces. The standard is proprietary, costs money. And the tooling to check that you haven't had a regression or anything else is expensive as well. And we're an open source project. So these sorts of things are challenges, and it's not just us here. The open source project will have this type of challenge. So what we're you know, focusing on is the deviations. Some of our members have access to these standards, and they're basically leading a lot of the work. But there are things that are potentially controversial here, and it's gonna be coming up with, okay, which ones you know, are we explicitly being deviating, and why? Do we have good reasons for doing it or not? But the, the developers are, you know, are understanding that this is a goal, and it's been a goal since the start of the project, so there's no surprises here. So what we're doing with Zephyr is we've, fun we've identified some of the components in our stack, and we are going to be initially focusing on those ones and working through the reverse engineering and the documentation and the practices associated with that, and then we're going to basically be expanding it out in stages of scope based on the members who are working on certain things. And then we're working with the certification authorities to keep building out our scope so that we have the argumentation ready and available to be used. So we're starting small, limited scope, and we're building out as we learn. That's the approach we're pretty much taking with Zephyr. The other case is we've got single core MCU cases, and we will be going to 
you know, there's other configurations of Zephyr out that are out there, including ones with hypervisor as guests and hypervisors and things like that. And eventually, over time, all of these use cases are going to need to be handled. So again, it's starting small and then working the complexity upward over time. And obviously, these requirements will grow with the use cases. So Zephyr's roadmap is we're about right here right now. I'm working on the MISRA C compliance, making sure we've got all the different commercial support compiler support because a lot of the safety standards require certified tool chains be used, things like that. Um, we've got sort of the next level of starting to work our way up on the compliance criteria and the documentation with the goal by our next LTS in two years of being ready for it. And one of our members is trying to go on an accelerated path, so maybe I'll bring things in. So if you want more information on Zephyr, um, I'll be giving a talk about Zephyr and a lot more detail about Zephyr. Um, for those who didn't raise their hands, um, at 3 o'clock, uh, along with Marty Bolivar. The two of us will be doing that one. And then that's our website, websites for the project, mail lists, and Slack channels for if you've got questions. The other project um, that I had on my list is Zen. And Lars is in the front row here, and he'll be giving a talk a little bit later today about Zen. And he'll keep me honest right now. So Zen has actually had slightly different starting points. They're basically... Zen is the hypervisor here that would sit in that end use case for us on Zephyr. And they're working towards getting, you know, Zen working in these systems and avionics and defense is where they've been spending their time and having their analysis up till now. And so Xilinx has a very stack, this EPAM stack, the automotive. So they've got different use cases they're looking at. But again, they're going after the same goal. And they're trying to figure out, okay, how can they take this hypervisor? So they've scaled themselves down to some extent in terms of the, their problem space by focusing on the DOM zero for small systems. And they've got about 50K lock of code to deal with here. And I think they're working this pretty much explicitly for the ARM ecosystem. And they want to make it easy to survival. And they want to go after ASLB and these other specifications. And they think, the estimates they've got is they think they can do about five to 10 years, man years of effort right now from where they are. And they're focusing on this left side of the V model. So that V model I showed you first, they're focusing on that initially, and then refreshing the ARM port. So you'll be seeing that, and again, there's a lot more interesting detail um, in Lars' talk later today. And his slides are available online, and the talk is at 2.10. And they're working on the downer works and NASA stories too. So if that's of interest to you, you might want to check out that talk. The next project I want to just chat a bit about is Elisa, which is enabling Linux and safety critical safety applications. Uh, this is a new project. And um, we spun it up at the Linux Foundation because of our members wanting to have a place to collaborate on how do we deal with Linux. Because both of those two other systems were fairly small. There, it's, it's more amenable to the traditional types of approaches. Linux is used by everyone. It's very pervasive, but it's huge. And the rate of change in it is um, the, up, the tip upstream kernel is nine changes per hour right now based on the 5.2 release. The actual patches in, from the kernel that get their way moved into stable is one change per hour. And that was the, the stats that Greg was telling me recently. And so there's a tremendous amount of change. And a lot of those are security fixes. And a lot of those are just bug fixes. They don't distinguish between the two. However, with that rate of change and when there's security fixes in that mix, uh, you're going to not want, you're going to want to make sure that your Linux is up to date. And then you're still going to want to use it in a safety critical application, something like autonomous driving, for instance. People are wanting to use it in those types of contexts. So the challenge becomes is how do we do it? So first of all, we really need, we're focusing here on understanding our systems and looking at systems. And you need to understand Linux and how it's actually being used in that system to be effective. And, and so it's taking, rather than from the details bottom going up, it's looking top down. And the analysis and figuring out what interfaces are being used, and then how can we take this to the next step. So, it really is on the way we're using it. You have to understand your system. You have to have better tooling than we have today in some ways to understand what's going on 
and then who's making changes and may it impact you, what's your traceability. So there's a lot of issues we're gonna to have to be looking at here with the tracing and improving that infrastructure for understanding implications of applying patches. Um, we are gonna be working with the compliance standards. Um, we've got Underwriters, Limit, Underwriters Laboratory participating actively with us right now, as is Tube Sud, because the certification people are on the same side. They're here seeing these Linux systems come at them and they don't know what to do with them because they're not the same things that they used to see. So they're sitting and working with the other participants in this project of trying to figure out what makes sense to look at and what gives you confidence that things are going to be safe. And so, you know, the key here for this organization is, okay, how are we going to make this effectively? It's going to be the processes and methods again. So that is the angle we're going to be working towards. And the complex systems and the qualities of the Linux kernel are going to be a very important part. And then also, we, you saw we had a culture clash between these two parts. It's education that has to happen between the two sides. So there'll be outreach into the safety community the same way I'm hoping to get more safety people here talking to the Linux community. Um, the path forward is functional safety is about managing the risk. And the Linux-based systems can only be understood within a space. And understanding this and building up these proposals is going to be key for us all. So Elisa's mission is to come up with a set of elements, processes, and tools that can be incorporated and make the systems amenable to the certifications. That's what it's focusing on. It doesn't have an endpoint. It's not going to get one version of Linux done. It's working on trying to figure out a process that you can take a version of Linux through that you can work with your authorities to make the appropriate argumentation that you are going to be safe at the end of the day. And so this is, you know, we've got researchers participating with us. We've got industry, you know, we've got people building products. Um, BMW and uh, Toyota um, are two of the founding members of this, as well as uh, KUKA and a host of others that care about these real-time systems and these safety systems. So you'll be seeing more of these elements showing up, but the answer isn't known right now. The question is getting the right people in the room and discussing it and hopefully figuring out what everyone's gonna get comfortable with at the end of the day. So the, this group is open as well. People are welcome to join our mail list and help work on coming up with what tools we need, what processes. Um, we wanna come up with some Linux use cases using Linux to really study and the open APS use case I was referring to is one of them, because everything there is open. No one is worrying about NDAs and liability. They just want to make sure it's available to people. Um, and the, people are using it from the hobbyist perspective. It's not a sold product. So from that perspective, it's something we can actually analyze. Um, the open source community and the safety community and the regulation authorities and the standards bodies. Some of our members actually are participating on the standards bodies for the safety space. So they'll be taking this stuff back into there. And I've had some discussions like with the FDA, and there's interest there too. Because medical devices is an area that's seeing this coming down at them too, as well as the software build materials and the transportation and the security side. So at the end of the day, success is going to look like for this project, uh, processes and understanding some kernel features and tools for how to use the processes. And we've got reference systems out there for people to look from, and we can, Integrators and systems using Linux have, a guideline, have guidelines on how to go there. And we're trying to go for the industrial grade products over lifetimes, which could be up to 20 years. So we're working with projects like the Civil Infrastructure Project as well as the Automotive Grade Linux Project because we have common goals here. And we want to you know, basically get this fairly pervasive and understood in multiple hardware ecosystems. So both ARM and um, Sci-5 are members of this working on different hardware approaches. So we've got interest in those hardware ecosystems and making sure they've got things lined up for this to work with their ecosystems. So we're working with the authorities. We're working on feedback. Um, we have got want to get the hardware participation broadened beyond this as well, and then get a lot of tooling work, and then eventually get towards incident and hazard monitoring, the same way we do security monitoring today. But that's down the road. And obviously, education and evangelism are going to be a key part of this goal for this project. And the limits for it, though, is we're not going to engineer a system to be safe. Um, we're not going to basically you know, ensure that you know how to apply the methods. It's just helping you find the path 
and every, helping everyone find a path and coming to a, a way we can move our forward together with some degree of confidence. So we actually had a work, we had our first workshop now with this project. Uh, we're probably having a workshop every quarter. And at that workshop, we identified that we are going to go after this open APS as one of our reference systems. And uh, we've started doing the STPA analysis of Linux and how Linux is being used in there. And we'll be continuing doing that over the next couple of weeks, um, working towards having a further review at our next workshop. And then the other use case that's happening is the autonomous driving case. There's a lot of interest in some members on this one. And there's some prior work on the Silti Linux MP stuff. Um, there's an Annex QR analysis that was done, as well as a root um, PDF that's there, that they're um, analyzing right now on the mail list. And I expect there'll be meetings on discussions on how much they want to continue with that direction or find a different one. So that's kind of what's happening with Elisa. And if you guys want more information about Elisa, uh, the next workshop is in Cambridge, UK, and the mail list, anyone can join and anyone can participate in the discussions. All are welcome. And so I just want to sort of close with the thoughts that, well, you know, open source software is pretty clearly eating the world. It's in, you know, Apple phones as well as Android phones. It's in BMWs. It's in Teslas. Linux is in a lot of these places. And we need to figure out how to make sure that we have confidence when we're using it underneath the covers that we will be safe. So it can coexist with open source projects. We do need to get the quality levels up there. And we need to manage the expectations and start small, build out, start with use cases, build them up, and then work it from there. And that's true for all three projects is we're starting with certain points and we're building our way up from them and we're learning from different angles and trying to see as much as we can to share tools. So um, the Elisa project and the Zen project are busy looking at tooling discussions. I'm trying to cross-pollinate some of that into the Zen Zephyr project. So we, we have, um, you know, there's, there's a variety of elements that are coming into play now, but we don't have the full story. And anyone who wants to participate is welcome. And with that, questions? Go for it. Yep. And one of them was we cannot get you to a point where out of three links would be suitable. But wouldn't it be reasonable that a deliverable would be coding best practices to colony back to maintainers and contributors so that it makes that easier to go through certification? So the, the Linux kernel already has coding guidelines and best practices already yeah, documented so and enshrined. Right. So I think it's a question of getting enough buy-in from the kernel maintainers that they want to go in this direction. We can't dictate things from the sidelines. Go for it, Darren. If I may. Please. <laughs> uh, so keep in mind that we have 15 million lines of pre-existing code in the link. So it doesn't matter if we change the coding guidelines today. In order to be able to use Linux in a safety-critical environment, we have to be able to show equivalent Yeah, and in, in like in a project like Zephyr, where the community has started with this as a goal in mind, it's more amenable that we can put t tools into our CI, CD build loops and potentially look at this sort of thing. It's more amenable. But the Linux kernel has a process that's worked and has high quality at this point already. And so it's a different set of argumentations that are being used. Okay. A lot of it depends on like system 
It's, it's, yeah, it's a question of, let's get, we need to get our reference systems identified and then start looking at, can we do the analysis and what are common grounds on a bunch of systems to put a framework in place? Okay, okay so we're gonna need, that's gonna be down the road a bit for us, at least on Lisa. Go for it. Uh, yeah, so some of our members are members of these standard orgs, and they're actually acting as, cro as bridges into them for us. Uh, one of our members, and Elisa from ARM, is um, a member of 61508, for instance. And so they're working on the next rev of that, and so, you know, he's going to be acting as bridge. And there's other members, there are bridges into other groups as well. And so the more we can get coming to the table to discuss this in these workshops and in these analysis sessions, and coming up with documentation and best practices advocated, I think the faster we're gonna move. But this won't work unless we have them participating in the discussions. And that's why um, when the CTO of uh, Underwriters Laboratory, he gave us a quote for our opening. So they're pretty committed to be there as is Tube Sud. And these elements are gonna be hope all part of it. I'd like to get more of them. There's Exceda and there's a few others that I'd like to actually get into these discussions as well so that we can actually get everyone sort of comfortable with the de what, what the decisions are. It won't be just the developers dictating, it'll be the negotiation. And that's, I think, where the, um, for, Elisa, for Elisa, that's where it's gonna be interesting. Yeah. So the UL guys are busy going through and doing a review of that right now, and that's going to be one of the discussions at the next workshop. Cool. And we're all, we also, the Elisa project meets every week on a Hangout channel and has, a, there's odd, you know, discussion that sort of advances things between these workshops a bit, but the work and coordinates the community that way. But the workshops is where people sort of divide into their areas of interest and are working on getting documented, you know, documentation out and things like that. We're also, you know, working on making sure we've got all the right disclaimers and things like that put in place to make everyone comfortable too with that. So there's some interesting framework questions. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your attention and thank you for coming. <laughs>